Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Beyond Celiac Town Hall. We're going to give everyone just a minute or two to join while we so we'll just wait a couple minutes as people start to join. While you're waiting, if you want to put where you're from in the chat so we can see uh, where everyone is dialing in from, that would be great. Okay. It looks like we have a good amount of people here, so why don't we uh, get started? So to kick things off, um, I'm Kate Avery. I'm the Director of Research and Patient Engagement at Beyond Celiac, and we are joined today by uh, Dr. Mark Davis of Stanford University. So at Beyond Celiac, we're very interested in the non-gastrointestinal symptoms of celiac disease. We feel like those symptoms are often overlooked by doctors um, and fatigue is one of the big symptoms that we hear a lot about. And when we looked at data in our patient registry, Go Beyond Celiac, fatigue was one of the top non-gastrointestinal symptoms that people report when they're exposed to gluten. So we're very interested in studying these on our own and also interested in funding research that looks into these kinds of symptoms. Um, so we first heard Dr. Davis speak at a National Institutes of Health presentation about fatigue and autoimmunity, which is the topic that he joins us to speak about today. Dr. Davis is the director of the Stanford Institute for Immunity, Transplantation, and Infection. He's a professor of microbiology and immunology and a Howard Hughes Medical <laughs> Institute investigator. We're very glad to have him with us here today. And what we'll do is um, Dr. Davis will give a presentation and then we'll follow the presentation with questions that um, you all submitted when you signed up as well as questions in the chat. So if things come up, uh, we'll either answer them at the end of the presentation or if it's something that uh, my great colleagues at Beyond Celiac can answer, they'll answer you right away in the chat. So welcome Dr. Davis and thank you so much for joining us. Uh, thank you, Kate. I'm happy to happy to be here and happy that you have uh, such great uh, participation. Um, I'm gonna uh, start sharing a screen um, just here and uh, first off say that I I don't have uh, really much information about fatigue per se. I mean, it's not like we're not looking for, things, uh, but it just hasn't, um, it, it's a tricky issue. There's uh, nobody knows quite what to look for. We are looking intensively and I think we have some leads that could pay off uh, and, and be uh, really important. But for right now, I think what we have done is uncovered a whole mechanism of T cell tolerance that uh, is likely directly involved in uh, celiac and and uh, every other autoimmune disease we've ever looked at. So um, it's not uh, a, I think a smoking gun in terms of fatigue, but it's definitely a smoking gun in terms of what what are, what are autoimmune diseases? What what are some of the fundamentals? And and it looks like um, most of the attention has been on another type of regulatory T cell that is not as directly involved as the one we've discovered. So uh, so let me um, take you through that uh, data and, and hopefully I won't um, tax your scientific knowledge too, uh, too much. Uh, but just uh, start off with the, the general question of fatigue is, you know, this is very, uh, it's common amongst uh, almost all autoimmune diseases. Uh, it's also um, obviously a feature of uh, chronic fatigue syndrome or ME, um, as it's sometimes called uh, chronic Lyme disease and long COVID. And we are looking at this whole spectrum. I mean, we're, we're, we're uh, uh, 
um, basic scientists and we're looking for basic mechanisms. Um, we're not uh, clinically competent. Uh, I avoided medical school it, it, and there should be a lot of patients grateful for that for that reason. Uh, but uh, I do what I can and and uh, mechanistic insights are what is sorely lacking in uh, autoimmunity. And so um, I think that's good. Uh, the other thing is that um, modern biology has been built on inbred mouse models, and that's been great for the basic science of immunology. There are, you know, a lot of weird things that happen in the immune system that you needed inbred mice to really figure out. And and uh, something like 10 Nobel Prizes have been given out over the last 60 years uh, just because of the insights and because of how important uh, the immune system is to just about everything in terms of health. Uh, but there are a lot of blind spots in the inbred mouse model, and uh, and definitely fatigue is one of them. Um, you know, I've heard a lot of talks about autoimmunity models in mice, and I don't remember anyone mentioning fatigue ever, because uh, how are you going to, you know, what do you, you can't ask the mice if they feel tired. So it's just kind of a, so... Um, such a non-item based on what people can do. And of course, this is also a huge problem um, for uh, uh, patients uh, like yourselves with celiac disease or other autoimmune diseases where the doctor basically, they have, they don't have a diagnostic test they can order. Uh, and they basically, and nothing they could do, even if the test comes back, oh, really fatigued. Uh, that's, that's, they can't do anything. And so human nature is just to ignore that. Uh, but that's exactly where basic scientists and uh, physician, physician scientists need to uh, be involved because there, there's is such a mystery here about what uh, what's going on. So um, these and other uh, items are really what convinced me 20 years ago that we really should do uh, human studies and and figure out how uh, how to make that work. I mean, mouse studies are are much easier and and you have tremendous flexibility um, that you don't have with humans. A lot of technology has been built up with mice, uh, almost none of which you can use on humans. Uh, so we've had to invent a whole. Uh, uh, palette of technologies that were specifically able to be used on human beings, uh, particularly on blood samples. What can you get from a lot of human beings, healthy or, or not healthy? Um, blood samples are kind of the um, key because they have, they have a microcosm of your immune system. And uh, if you know how to read them, uh, they can tell you important things. Uh, and so that's been part of part of the shift that we've had to make uh, to study humans is to really build technologies around blood samples. Uh, no one takes blood samples in mice. I mean, there's so little blood uh, and you can so easily get uh, lymphoid organs. Uh, but this situation is dynamic and it's really changing in interesting ways that are going to greatly empower um, human studies and, and have already. Uh, so, um, and, and that was amusing to be asked to write a review uh, on the current state of the art of, of mouse immunology versus human immunology. And I, I couldn't resist uh, making a, a joke uh, based on a, a famous comment of uh, uh, people long ago that, um, that, that we, we were building in science, you're always building on what what went on before, um, but it was interesting in this in this review um, just to see how people have made various efforts to try to model uh, diseases on mice, on humanized mice, on on all sorts of variations, and how this was really none of this was really going to be a substitute for direct human studies, and and particularly here we identified a, a dozens of genes that were that are expressed in immune cells of human beings, but not in mice. And so there could be all kinds of mechanisms 
going on that that we will only know about if if we get into the human uh, realm in a um, much uh, more definitive way. These are these are just the 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 genes that we identified, um, and they're expressed in various um, lymph lymph uh, lymphatic cells, B cells, T cells, dendritic cells, the whole the whole gamut, and um, and I think some of these are going to be the key to uncovering new mechanisms, um, uh, maybe including mechanisms of, of fatigue, but that's it's still uh, speculative at this point. Um, so over the years um, at Stanford, uh, as you know, one of the main uh, missions of my institute has been to facilitate human work, and part of that has. Um, what has worked really well was is to create a facility called the Human Immune Monitoring Core facility that uh, could uh, basically collect all of the uh, a lot of the very sophisticated technologies that you need to use to understand um, what's going on from a human blood sa sample um, and to uh, beta test new technology. It's been very good at um, and some of this technology we've focused on has to do with T cells. T cells are one of the most diverse but important uh, subsets of lymphocytes um, in, in the body and uh, responsible for good things like defending against the virus and also bad things like um, autoimmune disease. They're, they're key drivers in lots of, of the different autoimmune diseases. Um, and uh, so, but going to the uh, fatigue uh, issue, what, what we've been able to do here, which has not been so great, with, is to collaborate with Marian ha Maureen Hansen at C Cornell on a big study and also funded by uh, Vinod Koshla uh, here, uh, is to, uh, she organized this clinical study of fatigue in uh, MECFS, I don't know where the D comes from, uh, uh, patients, because they, they're the ones that, that uh, with a little bit of exercise, they, they become extremely fatigued. And, and we use some of our most sophisticated uh, tools to analyze the blood samples. Um, and we saw some things that could be interesting, uh, but it wasn't, doesn't really, um, Nothing. Nothing really jumped out as as a key indicator of fatigue uh, in terms of the lymphocyte populations. Even even with the sophistication of of this uh, type of cell analysis that we did, um, we're now focused more on mitochondria, uh, which of course are the powerhouses of cells, and um, I think might well be the key to um, understanding. Uh, fatigue because it's it directly correlated with energy and uh, presumably that how how energetic you feel. But anyway, uh, long story short is we we spent a lot of time analyzing blood samples from chronic fatigue patients versus healthy controls, and you know there was slight some slight differences here and there that m might eventually be s significant, but but it really wasn't um, useful and. You know, this is this is um, this is normal science. This is this is you know you you can't be um, um, you can't get too depressed about disappointments in experiments because it happens all the time. You have to you have to focus on what might work and and just keep keep going. And, and in fact, a, a colleague had a quotation from Winston Churchill on his uh, desk, which was uh, success is nothing more than enduring failure after failure with undiminished enthusiasm. Uh, and that's really, that's the mindset that we have to have here in the experimental uh, biology, especially as it deals with humans, as it deals with disease, because we're navigating. We're, we're, it is, there's not a linear path to almost anything in biology. You have to uh, be opportunistic and and look keep looking for a way into a problem that's actually going to work for you um uh and and just there's just a lot of dead ends and so this this was uh one of the biggest dead ends we've had recently we're, we're, we're pretty good but this this really did not result in anything 
but this did uh which really and and started with celiac so um uh long ago 10 years ago uh i had this uh, very bright um uh gi fellow arnold hahn came in and um and i think now he is at columbia and i think now he received his received funding from uh, your organization so that's great very smart guy and he came to me one day and said i want to study celiac disease and i said why do you want to study celiac we never we haven't done anything with celiac i, I know nothing about it and he said no no it's the only human autoimmune disease that you can legally uh induce in volunteers and we went back and forth and you know uh ultimately i i gave in you know i, I think if people are passionate about something that they have a lot of uh a lot vested they'll, they're going to do the best they can and so uh i eventually agreed to let him do this he was able to recruit uh, a handful of patients i think only five uh, uh celiac patients on a gluten-free diet and uh and the protocol is really just have them uh eat some bread for a couple of days uh although recently we had a, a subject request that instead of bread could he drink a particular kind of german wheat beer and uh we thought yeah well that's that's so much more exciting and, and I like wheat beers myself and and I could just imagine how this poor fellow was pining away for a nice uh, wheat beer and and yet couldn't have one but and the study gave him the gave him the a chance since he's going to have have um an an episode anyway might as well go in style with the with the wheat beer so if anyone asks you to be on these studies, uh, just sing out that that you don't want just the old bread treatment. You want you want something a little more more exciting. Uh, so anyway, long story short is that we did this study and uh, it showed what other studies had shown, which is that there is a spike in the blood after uh, six days after the challenge. There was a spike in the blood of gluten-specific CD4 T cells. Um, and, and that's people have been doing things like this for a long time. And uh, Ludwig Solid had done something similar with, uh, with uh, Tetramers. So, um, but what was really shocking and interesting was that it wasn't just the CD4 cells. It was also uh, another type of T cell called CD8 T cells. Uh, and yet a third type of T cell called, oh, oh, sorry, uh, gamma delta T cells. Now, just to uh, fill you in a little bit about this, is um, CD4 T cells are known as helper T cells mostly, and their job is to help uh, B cells make antibodies. Um, so that's a, a solid connection. CD8 T cells uh, are most known as cells that kill abnormal cells. So if a cell is infected with a virus or is cancerous, uh cd8 t cells are what you want for that job uh to to uh, kill those recognize that they're abnormal and kill them gamma delta cells are a much more mysterious type of cell um and we don't know very much about them but but here they were they were all they were all coming up to the party here uh six days after the challenge and then they all went away um and that was fascinating that that said there's really something going on here that we have never seen before. No one has seen before at this time. And um, what what does it mean? And um, it turned out that we really couldn't figure out what it meant until years later, uh, Narisha Salagrama, another postdoc, came to the lab. And he had spent his thesis working on this mouse model of autoimmunity called EAE. And I said, um, since you know all about EAE, uh, could you just induce the disease and then look at the blood of the mice um, to see if you see anything like what we're seeing in celiac? And it was kind of a desperate move. I mean, it really didn't, uh, it had, we had run out of options. And uh, this was the only thing I could think of that, that might keep this story alive. And yet uh, it was great that he, um, he did this and uh, he immediately inducing this demyelinating disease, which a whole cocktail of noxious substances. Uh, you can make these mice sick and get 
give them a, a debilitating myelin, demyelinating disease. Sure enough, he saw a spike of CD4, CD8, and gamma delta T cells in the blood at day 10, which is when the disease first gets going after induction. And then a week later, he saw the same three cell types coming up in the blood. Um, and then there was even an echo of that a few days later, like three waves of CD4, CD8, and gamma delta T cells. And because these were mice, we could look in the brains and central nervous system, and we could see some of the same spikes coming up at the same time. So this says, okay, wow, this is um, going across species. Uh, it's connecting two very different uh, types of autoimmunity. One, one kind of very cooked up induced autoimmunity in mice in a mouse model, and then a natural uh, form of autoimmunity, of course, in the celiac patients. So this enabled us to drill down because they are mice. We're able to drill down, use some of our T cell technology that we've been developing over the years um, to really figure out what are these cells recognizing and what are the, what's their role? Why why are they all together in this and uh, what does it mean? And the long story short is that um, this CD4 cells and the gamma delta cells were part of the pathogenesis of the disease. They they directly did bad things to the mice but that the CD8 cells were suppressive, that they were holding back those pathogenic T cells. And so there was kind of a yin-yang thing going on here where the CD4 and gamma delta cells were pushing towards autoimmunity and the CD8 were trying to hold them back. And we could show that by specifically stimulating the CD8 T cells uh, as shown here and basically suppressing the disease. This is an index of the of the disease severity, three being really severe, the mice are paralyzed. Um, but when we when we pushed these CD8 T cells specifically, we we're able to actually prevent the disease in most of the mice. And and the few mice that had some disease had had a very low level. So so we were knew we were onto something. But there was also uh, we were also frightened because. Um, much earlier, the biggest disaster in modern immunology occurred in the uh, later 70s or early 80s, where there was a whole field of CD8 T cells that were said to be suppressing um, active immune responses. And there was some uh, major groups and funding and other stuff uh, going on that, that convinced most people that this was real. Um, and then one day it just collapsed. One day there was a, some pivotal experiment that showed that it was all BS. And I, I've been telling students before we ever did these experiments, I've been telling students that CD8 suppressor T cells did for immunology what the Titanic did for the cruise industry. That one moment there was this impressive looking field, thousands of papers, the band was playing, the, the lights were shining, it was very impressive. Uh, you know, people were dancing on, on the deck. Uh, and then, boom, it was all over. It, it just collapsed uh, in a, a very dramatic fashion. Uh, and so, uh, Narisha, the postdoc, is pictured here. Um, he, told, he showed me the suppression data, and immediately I immediately flashed back to this earlier disaster and and he knew about it also and I, and I said what the hell is this um and he said I don't know I'm at the mercy of the biology which I think is just absolutely uh correct sentiment you're seeing something you didn't expect it's shocking uh and that's but that's what it is you, you you know we're using very powerful tools here and so it's not the data is not fuzzy at all the data was very clear and so we're all we're all just kind of in shock and wondering where this is going to go and are we being fooled like people were long ago and it turns out luckily not luckily not it was totally solid we, we basically have discovered uh, a, a new principle in autoimmunity
And uh, we, of course, we're anxious to carry this into humans as quickly as possible. And so uh, it turns out, actually, this paper came out in Science last year. Um, we uh, looked at a particular type of uh, rare population of CV8 T cells in, in humans called cure positive CV8 T cells. Normally, these are just one or two percent of um, circulating CV8 T cells in, in healthy people, but they're clearly elevated in many people with autoimmune diseases like uh, lupus. It can, uh, they're up tenfold in some patients in celiac, uh, somewhat less, but still. There, there are quite a few celiac patients that had elevated levels over the healthy controls. Similarly, MS patients. So we're looking at three different types of autoimmunity. And, and, and that's a good thing about looking at the, the science part here is that if people in its clinics, really the celiac people talk to celiac people and MS people talk to MS people, it's a very balkanized. And, and I think that's a recipe for missing unifying principles. And, and so that's why I'm, I'm, I really like that we're able to survey across these and uh, other autoimmune diseases uh, and see these uh, similar things that work. And particularly this, this population of cells is important. And this is um, uh, the even more telling experiment with uh, Nielsen Fernandez Becker is a, a clinician at Stanford that uh, specializes in celiac disease. She's a DI, GI doc. She can get biopsies, and she did get uh, biopsies from um, celiacs in remission versus active celiacs. And there was a clear uh, correlation in the level of these cells and the activity of a, the disease. So, um, but one thing that puzzled us was um, we looked at these, these cells in both patients and in healthy controls, and we couldn't see really any difference other than the number of the cells. And we puzzled over that. And finally, um, we had the idea that, well, maybe the job of these cells has to do with infectious diseases. Um, and so um, luckily, the hospital next door was filling up with COVID patients. And so we had, uh, through a, a great collaborator, Kari Nadeau, we had access to 60-some samples of, of COVID patients in various uh, states of disease. And we could clearly see that the, they were elevated, uh, the cure-positive CAs were elevated. So there clearly was a role there in, in that disease. Um, and, and that made sense in terms of autoimmunity because uh, we know that most, uh, most people experience autoimmunity following an infection. Uh, it's not always clear what the infection is, but there's an infection and then suddenly you have symptoms of autoimmunity or celiac or, or um, any of the many other autoimmune diseases that are out there. So, um, so it makes sense that we would be interested in uh, regulatory T cells that are involved in infection, because uh, especially if we think that their job is to suppress uh, self-reactive cells, which is what we think. And what was particularly interesting here was that we looked at what has been the best known regulatory T cell called the CD4 T regs, they're called. Um, and they weren't doing anything in COVID. They, they were just sitting there happily not no obvious elevation or uh, correlation with uh, disease severity. So um, so I think we're really on to something in terms of a not only a regulatory uh, T cell that's capable of suppressing autoimmunity, but that is con closely connected, that is upregulated in infection. So in, and suggesting that infection, or we know that infection can, what they call break tolerance, that it, it allows potentially dangerous T cells to come up uh, to fight the pathogen. Uh, but then if those get out of control, you might get autoimmunity. And, and so we're, we're looking at a pathway here that is likely to be really important in terms of controlling autoimmunity. Uh, we also saw this in flu. It's not just COVID. We also saw here 
CD8 T cells going uh, up in, in many uh, patients with, with uh, severe flu infection. Uh, and again, the CD4 GBRGs were uh, not really doing anything. Um, again, MECFS is our sort of touchstone for fatigue, but you can also figure this is uh, related to the, the whole issue of fatigue. And uh, uh, we definitely are seeing these cells elevate, at least in males with chronic fatigue. And, and I would argue that definitely this probably is, um, this might be significant here, though, not statistically, we don't, we don't have enough data, but but it definitely, uh, I, I suggest that these uh, things will be going on. This is a, a hypothesis that we developed from this, which is basically to say that in, in thymic development, which is where T cells come from, uh, some are self-reactive and some are only very weakly self-reactive. And they're all activated with an infection uh, if they have the right specificity for the pathogen. Uh, but the ones that have a high self-reactivity are particularly dangerous. Um, and that's, that's what we hypothesize these cure CD8 cells are doing. Uh, so to prove this, we went back to mice and basically knocked out this uh, cell, the equivalent cell type in mice, which are Y49 positive CD8s. The red is the knockout, so it's almost nothing left. Um, and uh, then we infected those mice with uh, a mouse virus called LCMV. Um, and uh, sure enough, uh, with, with wild type mice, uh, there was no... Uh, autoimmunity after the infection, the, the mice cleared the infection. The knockout mice also cleared the infection in the same way, the same time scale. But at the end of the day, there were antibodies on their kidneys. They had uh, a ne ne nephropathy uh, of, their, of their kidneys. And uh, we also did equivalent experiment with flu and, and uh, that uh, resulted in uh, inflammation of sustained inflammation in uh, in that um, neighborhood. Um, these cells are not just about um, tolerance in um, infection and and autoimmunity. Uh, we also looked with Kari Naido, We were able to look at uh, pregnant women in the second trimester, and uh, it was very striking the difference in care positive CD8 T cells in a women with a male fetus versus a female fetus. Uh, both the phenotype here, this suppress this, this suggests a lot of activity there. But here you just look at the levels and you can see that the uh, women that had a male fetus had like twice the level of care positive CD8 suppressor cells than women with a female fetus. So these cells are involved in autoimmunity, uh, sorry, in, in uh, tolerance to the fetus, uh, which is a whole area of, of tolerance that we're, there really hasn't been much progress on. We don't know very much about it, but uh, I would say that these cells are players in that, you know, because it's been an age old problem is how, how is it that a woman could carry um, basically a fetus that is expressing all kinds of foreign antigens and yet not have an immune reaction. Although, of course, there are pregnancies that go bad. There are spontaneous abortions. There are other things that, that might involve the immune response. No one knows much. And that uh, this that, that's a connection here that we're looking at. In fact, it, we, we are seeing something in terms of uh, some, some of the um, uh, dangerous things that happen in pregnancies. Uh, we're seeing activity of, of these cells. So they're trying to fight off some kind of immune response, basically is the interpretation. Uh, but anyway, stay tuned. This, this, this is a developing story. Um, but lastly, I wanted to also uh, talk about what we're trying to do to define um, the role of these cells, so particularly the different roles of the CD4 versus CD8 regulatory T cells that you know, we've known about CD4 regulatory cells for a lot, a long 20 some years. Uh, we're only just understanding these CD8 cells, but we're, we're using a very novel system, which is, we developed a few years ago uh, using tonsil or spleen uh, cells from human beings that we can um, manipulate into 
basically forming uh, little lymph nodes in a dish. Um, and, and they express, uh, we can vaccinate them and show uh, an antibody response based on the vaccine. Um, we're working with both spleens from organ donors and uh, tonsils from um, both children and adults that are getting tonsillectomies for uh, sleep apnea, actually, not, tons not tonsillitis so much anymore. Um, and what's been really uh, revolutionary here has been able to do gene editing, um, which has been popular in mice for decades, but it's not something you can do in living human beings, but you can do it in living human beings cells. And so this is uh, uh, Mustafa and, and Shin and my group uh, pioneered this and they uh, had uh, are getting terrific results, knocking out genes that are um, uh, necessary for either the CD4 or CD8 regulatory cells. And what's uh, nice is this result, which is that if we knock out the FOXB3, which is key for the um, regulatory CD4 cells, now the tonsils make autoantibodies. And women uh, tend to be better at this, making autoantibodies than men. Uh, but basically, we're able to mimic an autoimmune situation in a, in a dish. Uh, and that means that we can do way more to understand uh, the process, the signaling pathways, the, the players, uh, and so forth. And even more remarkably, just uh, that came out of this, it's that looking at self-specific B cells, uh, we find, found that uh, male, males almost never had any level of uh, beyond baseline of self-specific B cells for these antigens, but that women did or that uh, a number of women did. Sometimes all the women are like this. Sometimes it's just some of the women are up and some are down. Uh, so there's really, um, we're getting a glimpse of something important here in terms of why women tend to have uh, more autoimmunity than, than men. There's also an age factor here, um, of course. Um, and as older people are more prone to autoimmunity, women, Older women are more prone to autoimmunity than men. So that's uh, something we want to uh, get into more. Most importantly for celiac disease has been the recent results from Calvin Quo, our collaborator, and we worked with him on this. Basically, they took uh, uh, intestinal biopsies from celiac patients and are able to form organoids. Um, and those organoids reflect some of the same pathologies as the celiac disease. So this will be a great way to test drugs and they are testing drugs for um, uh, suppressing this type of celiac autoimmunity. So I think this is something, uh, it, it's uh, going back to um, the journal uh, very soon and, and I think it's gonna be a, a big hit in terms of publication. So um, just to uh, summarize here, we're, we're, um, we found a whole new uh, axis of tolerance uh, and, and suppression of autoimmunity in CD8 T cells, a subset. Um, and it seems to be much more proximal to autoimmunity. That is something that's maybe going wrong with this pathway that's not working, that's causing, that's helping to facilitate autoimmunity. Um, and we're seeing this across all these different autoimmune diseases, but also chronic Lyme disease, uh, to some extent, ME-CFS. Um, and now, as I say, we are we are intensely focusing on mitochondrial physiology, and particularly a uh, student, Vishnu Shankar, has been leading this effort and and doing great stuff. So um, I want to wrap this up. Should also mention that um, academic labs are not good at developing drugs, which is why I helped start this company called Mozart, which is trying to use this. Uh, knowledge about um, CD8 regulatory T cells to target in celiac and other uh, autoimmune diseases to see if that um, could be could be helpful therapeutically. And of course, uh, but they don't. Uh, none of our work is funded through this company. It's all uh, uh, consulting um, and equity and so forth. Uh, our funding comes from Howard Hughes, from the Gates Foundation, from 
National Institutes of Allergy and Infectious Disease, also the National Institute of Aging recently, um, and really great uh, folks in the lab, uh, Jing Li, Vishnu, Ben, um, MC and, and others. Uh, Lisa Wagger is now at UC Irvine. She did the um, uh, early tonsil organoid work. Uh, Nielsen Fernandez Becker uh, in the gut biopsies and Kari Nado for a lot of stuff. And I'll stop there. Thank you. I think that's 40 minutes, right? Almost. Great. Thank you very much, Dr. Davis. That was very enlightening. And it was so interesting to see um, how all of the background work has, has gotten you to the, the discoveries that you've made in, in the last few years um, about CD8 T cells. So we had a couple of really good questions from the audience as you were talking. So I just want to get to those first before we get to some of the um, questions that people submitted when they signed up. So um, when you were talking about the Kerr positive CD8 T cells are increased in um, pregnancy and particularly in women carrying male fetuses. Um, first of all, someone asked if you could explain why that would be more likely, like why a male fetus is more foreign than a, than a female fetus. So if you could just explain that. Yeah, well, one, I would say it's kind of surprising that there would be such a difference just by uh, having a male fetus versus a female, I, I, it's surprising. Uh, I'll say, I, but but it, there is a, there's a a famous antigen that's carried by males called the HY antigen because it's on the Y chromosome. It's one of the few genes. There aren't many genes on the Y chromosome, but it's a it's not only a gene on the Y chromosome, but it's a surface protein that is known to be very immune stimulatory or immunogenetic, as we we say, or immunogenic. Uh, so it could be about that, you know, it could be that the, the male fetus just has some particularly potent stimulatory, uh, molecules, um, uh, but that's about as much as we can go. I mean, I think if we, um, you know, if you think about, uh, a fetus, a fetus genotype versus a, a, the mother, um, there could be a lot of similarities or, or there could be a lot of differences. So that's one reason. I mean, you see the points going all over the place. Well, uh, that's probably because, um, you know, the, 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 there could be a lot of similarities or it could be a lot of differences. And, and so you're seeing a spectrum, but then even overlaying on that spectrum, you're seeing this effect of male um, uh, children. And, and the, um, yeah, so uh, I should also mention that we're seeing a general with pregnancy itself is elevating cure positive CD8 cells. Uh, it's just males more than female fetuses. Uh, so that that's consistent with, okay, you're harboring a foreign body for nine months and immunological things are happening. Um, and you're, and you're trying to suppress those so that the, the fetus can grow and, and, and be born and so forth. Yeah. Right. So is that someone asked um, if if those CD8 T cells being elevated, does that mean that pregnancy can kind of like break tolerance and induce autoimmune diseases the same way that we see sometimes like viral infections are linked to autoimmune diseases? Yeah. Well, uh, it's actually more interesting even than that, in, in that and which is that uh, women that are pregnant uh, that have an autoimmune disease, um, not all, but, but have, I think lupus and other, several other autoimmune diseases, they, they find this, that their symptoms are much less, uh, that their body has, uh, developed something that actually suppresses their autoimmunity. And maybe that's also, of course, related to, uh, uh, not harming the, the fetus, uh, it would be really good if we if we could figure out what what that suppression was because those those women would definitely much prefer that they don't have to get pregnant all the time to to suppress their diseases. So that's a, that's the whole area that I wish uh, I wish we knew more about. I think you could bottle that. You could uh, yes. <laughs> make a lot of money. <laughs> yes. So uh, kind of still on the topic of women and, and autoimmunity, 
Um, you talked about how women have more autoantibodies than men. And we do see in, you know, in, uh, in lupus and rheumatoid arthritis as two examples, you know, way more women have those diseases than men. In celiac disease, it's, it's not equal across men and women, but more men have celiac disease than have, than have lupus, for example. Is there, do you have any hypothesis about why, why we don't see kind of an equal effect across women and men across all diseases? No, I, I you know, I think that's a, it's a really good question. And uh, it's part of this whole uh, ignorance that we have about autoimmunity. Uh, I mean, we've made a certain amount of progress in understanding autoimmunity, but there's still such fundamental issues like, okay, maybe it starts with an infection, but then why doesn't it resolve? Why, why doesn't, why don't you go back to normal? Uh, something is happening that is preventing you from going back to normal um, and, and then can even progress to, to get worse. Uh, not, not so much in celiac, I think, but in definitely in MS and some other diseases that, um, there, there is a clinical progression and that's a key difference by the way in terms of medicine and and science is that in science we we think progress is a good thing in in, in medicine uh progress of a disease is usually usually a bad thing um so this part of there's a some cultural cultural issues here that that um i've never quite understood how how this all worked out but uh yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, one of the questions that's coming up in the chat and that came up when people registered as well was, um, so as you mentioned, celiac disease is the only autoimmune disease with a known trigger. You know, we know why people get the, the symptoms and it's because of gluten. Um, but people still have symptoms like like fatigue, fatigue is a big one, even without that gluten exposure. So can you, I know that you don't study celiac disease specifically, but could you talk a little bit about why that might be the case? Like why the body is still reacting even without the presence of the trigger or, or what continues yeah. of the reaction? Uh, yeah, I would just be guessing here, but but uh, uh, just thinking about this, um, you know, the, uh, if you have an autoimmune disease like celiac, you you have something is going wrong with your uh, immunological makeup, and it might be highly localized or it might be more systemic. Uh, that having fatigue in the absence of uh, eating, you mean on a gluten free diet, people are experiencing fatigue. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, one is uh, I've talked to a clinician recently where uh, one of them is actually studying non-gluten um, triggered celiac-like symptoms. So there can be things other than gluten that trigger that, and you may not know them, and it might be on a you know a, a low level that you you don't experience intestinal symptoms, but you've got something else going on. It also could be something where you you've got a a dysregulated um, immune system that is sort of fighting, constantly fighting against um, uh, some subclinical autoimmunity that uses your energy, but uh, it doesn't it doesn't rise to the level of where uh, a, a you know a celiac uh, intestinal episode might. So. Um, that those would be my my guesses here. Okay, yeah, that that's interesting, particularly because you know the the research that determined the safe level of of gluten exposure was not done on on many people, and certainly probably doesn't apply to everyone. There's probably people who react at a at a lower level, so that's an interesting thought that maybe that's what it you know is potentially still causing the the problem. Um. So a lot of people experience fatigue and a lot of people with celiac disease experience fatigue. It takes a long time for people with celiac disease to get diagnosed. And I think fatigue is one of those symptoms that can get um, 
overlooked or kind of be dismissed um, by, by doctors. I mean, there's a reason that chronic fatigue syndrome, it took so long for it to be taken yeah. seriously. Um, so are there blood tests or biomarkers that kind of identify when someone has fatigue versus being tired, you, you know, and it, to yeah. help to help the scientific no, community sure. and physicians take it more seriously? Uh, not, not right now, uh, for sure. And I think that's a huge unmet need. Um, and that's uh, part of where we're headed is, is can we develop something like that? Um, because I think that's key. That's key to getting much more attention to this uh, symptoms like fatigue. You know, if you don't have a, again, if you don't have a validated test, uh, people A, don't know that you, you you really have it or or what this, on what scale it's happening. Um, and especially, so they can't order a test. And even if they had a test, they don't know what you could do about it, you know? Uh, and, and all those things are huge barriers to uh, clinicians trying to do stuff. They, they, they want to do what, what they know how to do and what works. Um, and things that don't work or don't lead anywhere, they, they just don't have the bandwidth to worry about very much. Um, and, and so really that's where research comes in. That's, that's where we're um, trying to fill, fill the gap is to, to have, you know, it's a huge problem. Millions and millions of people um, virtually every autoimmune disease uh, reports fatigue, at, at least half, half of the population, if not much more. Um, so, um, so anyway, so I'm, I'm just, I'm really happy to be involved in this because it's such a, um, yeah, such an important thing. And, and our, our hope is that we can contribute and, and move this move this thing a lot further it's just been sitting there you know and people are suffering and uh it's 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 tragic of course uh, so anyway we're, we're we're working on it we're trying yes well we, we appreciate hope, it. hope yeah well so i think let's end on on a, a positive note so what is um the the future of this research you know what is one thing you think in the next five or so years that that's going to happen or be found out that you're most excited about? Well, I mean, I think these regulatory CD8 T cells are a huge thing and, and they're so proximal to infection and autoimmunity that I have to think that this is going to be the key to both understanding autoimmunity generally at a much better level uh, and, and leading to treatments because uh, you know, uh, for 25 years, we've been focused on this other type of T cell that has very profound effects on tolerance, um, on survival even. Um, but it seems to be leaving the job of infection to these CD8 cells. And to me that says, okay, this is, this is the key. Something's going wrong with this mechanism. What is it? And, um, and how can we uh, push the balance? And, and we have seen things like we have taken these CD8 T cells from celiac patients' blood and activated them and shown that we can kill gluten-specific CD4 cells specifically in, in culture. So that says that if we could push these cells um, somehow more than what they're doing now, uh, that, that might solve the problem. Um, now how, how to push them, uh, their ideas, how to do that. They're, they're not, not, um, impossible. Um, but it's also just understanding more about how are they, how are they not doing the job? Um, what else is going on? It, it, I mean, there'll be a whole pathway involved in this and uh, that's just, we're just starting to try to define that. So, um, and, and, but the potential is something that could work across autoimmune diseases. Uh, and again, that's, you know, to, to realize that clinically 
you need a company or a bunch of companies that have some blueprint of what it is that might work um, and then push along on do the appropriate trials and so forth which take forever and you know kind of like <laughs> I, 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 <laughs> I don't even like to think how many years it takes to get a, a to develop a drug and then and to actually get it approved it's just it's it's just a nightmarish process um and I'm, I'm glad to be on the basic science end of it because I, I that, that's that's much more my style and what what I'm good at so <laughs> that's your speed you can get things out faster yeah. than, than the drug companies can all right well thank you very much for that and we'll look for you know continued research from your your lab continued research from Dr. Han who as you said has our uh Early Career Research Award Great. that we sponsored at the SSCD. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> and uh, so thank you very much, Dr. Davis, for joining us. And for everyone else who is attending the town hall, thank you very much for being here. And we invite you to share your experiences with celiac disease by joining our patient registry, Go Beyond Celiac, um, and also to follow our research news where we try to make the kind of research that Dr. Davis and other people are doing uh, understandable to, to everyone so you can understand how it affects you and how it affects celiac disease. So thank you again, Dr. Davis. We really appreciate you being here today. Thanks for the opportunity. And I hope I, it wasn't too, um, too technical. So. You did a great job. Oh, thank you. <laughs> you did. All right. Thank you very much. All right. Bye-bye. All right.